Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. And I'm Jeff Fritz. And this is Intermediate ASP.NET Core 1.0. If you made it here somehow to the middle of our day uh, and you don't know how you got here, you might take a look at the beginner ASP.NET Core that we did before. It's a whole day of great beginner content. Yep. So what we're going to be talking about right now is this idea of middleware. Yeah, it feels like a loaded term, middleware. Yeah. It's software that's in the middle of something. It is, and it's not really clear uh, where it fits, uh, how it works, and what it means to people who are writing ASP.NET code that maybe in the past had written handlers yeah. or modules. Sure. Right? It's a and, different concept. Right. In the old days, uh, last week, uh, yeah. Before the new stuff, uh, there was this concept of the HTTP handler mm -hmm, and the HTTP mm -hmm. module. Handlers, of course, were an endpoint, right? And modules were the I'm listening any at all times. Yeah, right. And there was this concept of events, right? And everything was event driven, and the, you had all these modules that were out there. And when an event fired, whether it was init, load, pre-render, unload it would trigger all of the modules that were listening for that event. Mm -hmm. So you could have all these things happen at the same time. We're now middleware, well, it's more of a pipeline than this abstract event listening thing. Exactly. Before you would have something like begin request, and then we'd all listen into the begin request, and everyone would get an opportunity to mess up oh, the, yeah. uh, the system. But with middleware, it is a pipeline. If you take a look at this diagram on my screen right here, this is from the documentation at docs.asp.net. This is a really great diagram that gives you this idea that it is it's a pipeline, but it's also kind of a chain. And order matters. If you learn one thing about middleware, and we'll hear about it when you show me some custom middleware, mm -hmm. that the order of that middleware matters so much. You have some logic, yep. and then you have a chain to the next middleware, and you say next, and you pass your control to the next middleware, and it goes all the way to the end, until it terminates and then it rolls all the way back. All right? So we've got my silly little application here. This was the one that we did in the beginner ASP.NET Core where we were just talking about the basics of MVC. Okay. All this application does is basically nothing. <laughs> it uh, has a silly little model and it returns it to the view. So it's a little bit more than hello world. If we look at startup, it has the configure in our startup has basically the MVC services. We've got our hosting environment and our logging. So there's logging. We've got an environment check for development. And then we say use developer exception page. Now, there were two different configure methods there. We should touch on what those two different methods do because they're, they do two different things, mm -hmm. right? Configure services is configuring dependency injection. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the, uh, in the intermediate day here. But this configure method that starts on line 36, this is where we're laying out our middleware pipeline, right? right? It's almost sketching or drawing the pipeline and it's setting the tone for the rest of it. It's saying, it looks like this, it is in this order. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if you saw in our uh, discussion of authentication and authorization, we had identity appearing within there, and it appeared before use MVC because mm -hmm. it was something that would happen ahead of time. And we had to configure Facebook as a provider after identity was added. Mm -hmm. So what happens if we go and do something silly here? I'm just going to say app.run. Remember that app.run is kind of a terminating bit of yeah. middleware there. It's going to say, I'm going to do all of that work, uh, and I'm going to take over. It will say context, and I'm going to say uh, throw new. I'm going to cheat here. We're going to force an error, okay? Uh, invalid operation exception. Okay? So there's a little bit of, and we, need to and we go, and we go. Sometimes these things can get a little bit confusing, and I'll find myself okay, adding to... as many of these as possible. I actually forgot one there. Yeah, there you go. See, I just go like this, and just eventually, eventually, it it'll, eventually it'll work. Yeah, exactly. But actually, that's a good point. It can be a little bit confusing. Let's talk about that. Notice how when I move my mouse over 
these braces or parentheses, yep. it's lighting up the pair. So right, if I click here, right. you it's can showing see... you where it began, and it's showing you the closing one, exactly. the matching pair. So there's open, there's there, and then this extra stuff here, I don't know what I was thinking, not really probably needed. Not needed, but no Depends. foul, no yeah, harm. No foul, exactly. So here, we're going to throw an exception. Is this ever going to get the opportunity to happen? No, because that app run, it's a, as you said, it's a terminating piece of middleware. It's not passing control on to the next. If, if from our diagram, there's a next call mm -hmm. that happens. We aren't calling next here mm -hmm. within that, within your app run, so it's going to stop after it's done running this piece of code on line 49. All right. And in fact, let me remove that and run our app and just see what it does kind of by default here. Oops. It's saying that the app is being used by another process. That is because I am not running under IIS. I'm running under Kestrel. Remember, we switch mm -hmm. those ways here. We talked about that in the beginner day. So I'm going to just shut that down and run it again. Look at that. Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Not even information about that error? Not, not even information about that error. If we look over here. In our log. Yeah, oh, in our I logs. see a big red fail there. Right. There's our exception. Uh, but So I, I'm getting information. I'm finding out what's going on. I got my info. I got my fail. I got my call stack, including the line number, because I'm doing a debug here. But I didn't get anything friendly from a... Uh, a web perspective. And let's even look and see what happened. What do I get? I'm getting, look, I'm getting a 500 error, mm. right? 400 is your fault, 500 is my fault. So remember what you would see in ASP.NET in the past when you did that, right? You would oh, get, the, the yellow screen of doom. Right, or the yellow screen of death, the yellow yeah. screen of doom, exactly. You get that big yellow screen. With ASP.NET Core, it's important to remember that nothing's included by default. You have to yeah. ask for it if you want it. So we want to bring that back, that thing that I removed. If we're in the development environment, use the developer exception page. So that's effectively use yellow screen of death Yeah, is what that's saying. That's a piece of middleware. We can actually zoom in on that, see? Captures exception instances. That is what that for, and then generates an HTML error response. Now, it is it is something you had to opt into, but mm -hmm. there may be some environments where they don't want this running, and that's why we're saying is development is this the development environment? By default, we're not including this capability when you get to production. Right, a production error message could still happen, but it should not probably include my source code. No. Right. No, no. Where is this coming from? That lives inside of ASP.NET Core Diagnostics. So it's that diagnostics package that is making that possible. Makes sense. Okay. So let's run it again now, except we're going to include use developer exception page. Notice that the logging still happens. Yeah, we still see those fail mm -hmm. blocks. And that's totally fine. And that would be, that, that'll either go out to the console or Visual Studio's output window. Sure. Mm -hmm. Or in the case of uh, you know Azure, it'll go into storage or wherever we've decided mm -hmm. to put our, our tracing. Wh however you configure your logging provider. Mm -hmm. So this, as we said before, is the peaceful light blue screen of death. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of nice, though. You can see the raw details. You can see a Yeah, that, that block at the bottom looks more like what I expect out of Visual Studio when I get a stack trace. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because that kind of unfriendly thing is what you would expect. But in fact, look at this. You're getting the exact line of code. You nice. can see the queries and the cookies. See the culture. I can see headers. So you're, you're getting a nice experience here. But here's the important part. Maybe this isn't what your company wants. Maybe you want your own mm -hmm. screen of death. Let's say that you're doing products and shopping carts. Sure. Maybe shopping cart information is important to your exception page. Why not add shopping carts sure. or identity or OAuth or whatever makes you happy? Mm -hmm. 
before, do you know where the Elder Screen of Death lived? Like on disc? Where, where was it? I don't. I couldn't even Gosh, point to it. It, it was in the beast. It was hiding in a DLL somewhere, compiled and strong named and hidden in, mm -hmm. in yeah, the beast, the GAC somewhere under C windows. Exactly. Somewhere in the Global Assembly cache, there was a yellow screen of death that you could yeah. never change. Yeah. And uh, additionally, lots of people went to production, and we've all had that experience where you go to a web page and then you're like, wow, I'm looking at source code. And you yeah. get that kind of like, Nobody's supposed to be here. You know, yeah. it's like this is not okay. Um, this feels dirty. Right. So the problem here is that we the, we shipped that with the wrong default. Right. So in this case, you don't get an exception page unless you asked for it. Right. And if you specify the appropriate environment. Okay. So then the question is, what would this look like for production? Right. What do we want to do? So let's say, if it's development, do this. Okay. Else, it's anything but development. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. So then we can write a little piece of middleware here. Okay. Right? And if I understand correctly, we don't need to write middleware necessarily with its own class. No, you can use an anonymous object there in the middle. Okay. So we'll say app dot use exception handler adds middleware to the pipeline to catch exceptions, logs them, and then re-execute the request in an alternate pipeline. Okay? okay? So we're going to say exception handler and then we're not going to use app, okay? We're going to use uh, sub app. So this is an alternate pipeline because you know the 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 one that's broken is kind of ruined for us at this point. Sure. So we're going to go here and we're going to say sub app dot run and try to do some stuff. You've got a minus there. You think that's the problem? That's a start. I think I could just go like that. That's kind of a, that would be cool if that was a. That's a like thing. a flaming arrow. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I call it the hash rocket, but I like to refer to that as the Anders operator. Sure. Yeah. Context dot response dot content type. This is really low level stuff. Notice that I'm not sending it off. I could, but I'm not sending it off to a an, uh, an HTML page, a static page on disk. But you are you are literally handcrafting the HTTP response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not super friendly and uh, not super fun, but at the same time super powerful and useful to know that it's possible. Oh yeah, full control exactly. over all the things. Exactly. Now this is going to be our uh, production one. You don't want to have any errors in here. Sure. Right? And that's that's exactly the production message we mm -hmm. want to send on 53. <laughs> and, and here's a little funny uh, piece of uh, piece of history here. Uh, Internet Explorer has some issues with short errors. So if the error happens, yeah. and the HTML page is shorter than about five six hundred bytes, really, it won't show it. Are you kidding? That yeah, is yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, it is what it is. Okay. So we're going to make a new string, and we're going to put 512 spaces. Just for IE, a uh, little bit of context. Life happens. Luck comes at you fast. Okay, but what we really care about is up here. Maybe we'll want to say something like uh, "application error in production," right? Contact support. Right, something like that. Okay. This. Sub app happens within that exception handler. Let's make sure this is a little bit of fun as we try to figure out. May not make sure things are lined up. Do I need that? Need that? There we go. Let's see if that builds. There's an extra. Oh, you need a paren. Yeah. Paren. Right. Because and you... all of that. Is there? Oh, that one got dropped down. There you go. Yeah, there it is. Well, this is actually interesting. The fact that I'm having trouble doing that kind of shows that at some point I'm going to want to graduate to something a little bit more to putting maybe that in a class because that I enjoy doing. Oh yeah. App dot use mm -hmm. this, and I go app dot use. I like using all this stuff. This is great. Look oh that. yeah. Use middleware. How do I do that? 
why you know why do this but that's right. fine and use exception handler is a middleware helper and I'm passing in what I want it to do right and like you said you're in a a new instance of another pipeline that's mm -hmm. being retried you have the exact same run syntax that you have a little bit further down there on lines 59 through right. 62 so while it might be a little bit overwhelming you eventually figure it out oh yeah okay so this though happens in development mm -hmm. this happens in production Yep. So I'm going to have to change my environment to indicate that we are in production. Okay. Okay. So let's give this a try and see what happens. Look at that. Nice. That happened. Let me try it on Internet Explorer. Do I have Internet Explorer? Make sure it worked. Cool. Works just fine there, too. Works great. So that, now, notice this, though. The log still happened. The yep. error still happened. Yep. It's just that I chose to show it to the user in a, uh, in a different way. Sure. In this, in, in this context, I could then, uh, you know, send it off to, you know, raygun.io or Application Insights or a third-party application management company. Sure. You're, at this point, you're only writing to the response here on those lines. Mm -hmm. right. You can absolutely jump off, send a text message, send notification to right. my logging provider. Well, and that's why you have your logger factories. And when we saw yep. at the very end of the beginner discussion where we added like Serialog, a third-party logger. Oh, yeah. We could plug it in. Uh, there's even a, a, a logger for Slack, mm, like HipChat. Okay. So lots of opportunities there. Now, in this case here, we're returning a, uh, a 500 error. Right. Okay. But I might also want to return, you know, other things. I might want to understand how can I make a custom page if there's a, uh, you know, a 404, for example. So this this exception here, this I forced an exception. Right. Let's force a 404. Okay. You know, I could I could maybe make a file and then you know not ask for it, but because we're down here uh, at the HTTP level, I'm going to just show you that we can go and say uh, I want to return a 404. And then we have to go and say, you know, don't do anything. So 404, we're forcing a 404. Our app now only knows how to say nothing. Saying file not found. Yes, that's the only thing our app knows how to use. This is officially the most useless app that is possibly out there. And it doesn't even say anything for a 404. No. It's just it's the lonely uh, and sad blank 404. All right, same kind of thing. This use exception handler idea, I can go and say register, just like we registered our exception handler there. I could say not use exception handler, but I could say use status code pages. Okay, and then in here we could say, you know, not found. You know, it's not you, it's me. By saying use status code pages and then passing in that, that additional sub pipeline, that gives me control over what I decide to do yep. for each of these errors. And that can be any error. In this case, let's see what that looks like. Terrific. Custom 404, right? Simple. Very nice. But again, uh, I had to do a little bit of work here, and I didn't yeah. really manipulate the uh, the custom middleware. I understand that you have an example that's a little more sophisticated. Yeah, we can get a little bit more sophisticated on on my machine now. We're so going let's to take, take a, a second and let's switch over to your box and see what's going on on your machine. So we've seen a number of things here with the environment, and and we're changing the environment, and different things happen on the screen. So I want to actually start putting information about what environment I'm in on the screen as a little indicator, a little image, so that I know that I'm in development, I'm in staging, or I'm in production. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to show you some code that we wrote here. Uh, I want to use syntax like this, use environment display. All right? Okay, so I could, we did tag helpers. I could go and make one that output the environment, but I'd probably have to do that on every page. Right, you'd have to include that everywhere. By, by making some middleware that includes that environment label everywhere, it automatically gets processed in the pipeline as we hit that 
during processing. I see. So it becomes a piece of diagnostics middleware as opposed to something I'd add to my layout page in my view. Exactly. It's always there, and when I don't need it, I can comment it out, or as I'll show you in a little bit, I've actually written it so it reads a configuration option and will activate appropriately. Nice. So this use middleware display, it's an extension method using that same use syntax that that so when you go app dot if you yes. zoom in on that each of those yeah zoom in on those you can see that each of the uses there they are they all have that little down arrow yep they've been spot welded onto the app object and that's when the use environment display showed up because uh, you declared it as an extension method I declared it as an extension method and all I did was create another class out here that just houses some middleware extension methods. So here I have use environment display. Mm -hmm. I pass in that application builder, right? right. That's, the notice that's that you this put, you app said, thing. You said this. Yes. App, that's the syntax for an extension method. And what's funny about this is that this is a nothing method. Exactly. It's one line. Right. This makes me feel like you could probably just say app.use middleware. Absolutely. But this gives me that little bit of syntactic sugar that I can mm. just say app.use and go find that named piece of middleware that I like to use. Syntactic sugar or syntactic splenda. Sure. Depending on your dietary needs. I'm just saying. Just saying. Okay. All so right. then use middleware environment display. That's where the real work is. That's where the real work is. So I wrote this environment display class and it's it's actually a pretty simple class. I don't have to inherit from some base class to write middleware. Really? It's just a plain object? It's just a plain object. The only requirement is that you have a task invoke mm -hmm. method. So this is an async task invoke okay. that's going to receive, it always receives, the HTTP context when the pipeline wants to invoke this particular piece of middleware. I see. So kind of thinking back to that image, as you're going in the chain, when it's your turn, and they say, they say next, and then you have to think about uh, you got it. your HTTP context. The constructor, I'm receiving a number of input parameters here, the re a request delegate for what the next item in the chain is. Mm -hmm. So this is called when the chain is being built. So it's giving me some information as to who's next that I'm going to call. Okay. And I'm also grabbing some information about the hosting environment and my configuration. And this is using dependency injection. You're getting those because you put them in the method signature. Yep. And we'll learn about that in another module. Yep. Yep. So I, I'm, I'm stashing them in some read-only fields here on lines 19 through 21. And then I'm going to come down here. I have an enabled, is enabled check here to say, if there's an environment display set in my configuration, grab that value. Otherwise, don't display the environment. It's mm -hmm. false. Right. So by default, I'm going to turn it on inside my configuration. Okay. Um, but let's actually take a look at the invoke where I'm actually working with the middleware here, writing and interacting with that context. Mm -hmm. So the first things I'm doing here is I'm grabbing the actual HTML for my glyph that I want to drop on the response. Okay. I have a pair of helper methods down here that all they do is generate some CSS style to add to the head and then the actual div that I'm going to drop on the body of my page. I see. Now are these going to be all together in one section? No, they're not. I want to put my head elements here, my CSS stuff, mm -hmm. up in the top inside the head of my page because we like our styles to be inside the head so they get processed nicely. Oh. But then I'm going to add this element at the very bottom of my page so that it gets added on to every page right before the body tag, the close body tag that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm adding them in two different places. Now, returning back here to the processing, I grab an, a reference to the current context response body. Okay. So as the HTTP pipeline is happening, I'm going to go and get a copy of what's been added to the response at this point. That's not, like, I'm curious, that's not super efficient, right? The, no, it's not. This isn't something you'd go to production with. This, no. I mean, with respect, isn't this technique, it's a little aggressive in the sense of you are, like you said, you just made making a copy. Yeah. So yep. that kind of tells me that middleware can both do good and evil. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, right? you could probably you could write middleware that isn't efficient, that mm -hmm. uses a lot of memory, mm -hmm. but you know, runs a regular expression on the entire body. Oh, gosh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay.
So, all right, this is just a sample to show how some of these things work. It's not optimized, of course. Understood, but it is very powerful. Absolutely, and we're going to see some of that here in this next couple lines. Mm -hmm. So I create a memory stream there on 57, right. of course, using a using statement so that we release our memory when we're done. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to get a copy of, I'm going to put my memory stream back into the context. <clears throat> So now I'm receiving what's going to be written into my response in my memory stream so I can analyze that content. Mm -hmm. Typically, response is a stream that you can't scan through and modify. Mm. So, uh, and then I do this await next, right? This is that delegate that we got passed up here in the constructor mm -hmm. that says, here's the next thing to execute in the pipeline. So execute those next things, go all the way through until you terminate, get to that MVC action uh, method. So the entire page finishes its job. Right. It's done rendering all of its HTML, and it's placed it on the response body, which, as we know, is now our memory stream that we control. Oh. All right. So I've now intercepted and captured that content. So now on 64, I'm going to put the old, the previous body that was already there, back onto the response make sure that I'm working with an actual HTML output, right? right? I don't want to go and intercept JavaScript or CSS. And then I'm going to write back into that, if it's not HTML, I'm going to write out, you know, what exactly was output. Mm -hmm. The real interception here and the power that we're going to do, I'm just doing a, a uh, string variable here to grab that content that was written into that stream. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to insert my CSS at the top, right before the end head tag, and then I'm going to replace the body tag with my div and the end body tag, and then write that back out. So I've intercepted, modified the content, and written it all back out, all in one shot here, in a couple dozen lines of code. Yeah. So, not bad. If I run this now, and we can actually take a look at how we're modifying, I don't, this is the, the default, uh, project that comes with Visual Studio. Okay, so the only thing you've done is add your middleware and said use. And use that, and right? It. And now I get my little glyph here, this little deer that says it's That's development. the development deer. That's the development deer. Yeah. So I can go and change my configuration over here. Um, I can turn that off right. by flipping my configuration. And if I restart... And you could also perhaps uh, set your configuration to reload on change. We saw yes. that in an earlier yep. uh, module as well. Now that's interesting. It didn't pick it up, even though I set environment display to false. Did you restart? I believe I clicked restart over here. Let's take a quick look. There is a check here. Let's look at your check for uh, your config. You know what? I, I think it might be reversed. I'm not actually doing the check for the config. I have this is enabled here. you never check for it. And I never check for it. So then so. if you're in the middle of this and you wanted to go and check for it, you should probably check for it really early on before you do any of the memory Before I do stuff. any of that stuff, just let so it go and do its await if it's next. In, if it's not enabled, then right. you just await next. So let's just do that right and then here. Bail. If not is enabled, I can say uh, await, next, pass the context, and return. Is it return task zero? Uh, you're right. Task dot from result? From result. What's it say? What's it say? It's telling me that a return keyword must be followed by an object expression. Return await? Hmm. Do you return the next? Do you return await next? You know what, let's just do that. And restart. No. Oh, didn't like it. Rather than returning, remove that return and then just fall through. So if it's enabled, else, and then, and then do, the rest, then do the rest of it. That makes sense. Okay. Right, let's see if that works. And build. 
Because when your configuration is set up right, you want to do as little as possible, if not nothing. Sure. There it goes. I like development deer. It's like ship it squirrel. It is. There's actually a whole family uh, of the deer there. And there you go. And there we go. Very cool. So there's several other deer there that when you have different environments, it'll show you those images appropriately. Mm -hmm. So it's a simple piece of middleware that's showing how we can do this great power, modifying that content, that HTML that's being output. You can also change this so that you're managing and outputting images or other binary content appropriately for your application. There's a lot you can do here, and we're just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. Middleware is fundamental to ASP.NET Core. It is. MVC, the pattern MVC, is itself middleware. It is. It's a collection of middleware. Identity is middleware. Everything is this middleware pipeline concept, whether it be a tiny piece of middleware that maybe logs something, mm -hmm. or squirrels away a request ID, or it's something big that fundamentally modifies oh, yeah. the HTML. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of power there. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, measure and test to make sure the performance is appropriate. Yes. But super powerful stuff. Uh, so we'll take a little break and we'll come right back.